Welcome to the Next Stage Quarantine Reading Series. I'm Charles Nord, the former Poet Laureate of Vermont. I'm going to read a few poems to you today on behalf of the Next Stage that sponsored a wonderful pageant here in Darrow's Orchard, the Green Mountains Orchard, uh, a couple years ago, a collaborative project that I did with Michael Bodell, who's a dancer and the choreographer of this pageant. Um, I wrote several poems about the history of the orchard, and I'll just start by uh, reading the first clearing and then proceeding with uh, planting, pruning, ripening, harvest, goshawk, return, uh, which, is the, which is the last poem. This was a wonderful occasion. There were about 500 people here from all over Vermont marching through the orchard with these giant puppets that Michael Bodell had put together, had, had made for the occasion and uh, several dancers, very festive and um, a timely uh, pageant that again, the next stage sponsored. Clearing, out of nothing called wilderness, called too much, called heaven, then not, called take, then clear into fields plotted and pieced, impossible. They said it first, too heavy, dense and rough yet but what? Turn back. Not yet. Find a garden beyond the garden, someone said. The land is blessed despite the curse of work that is a ruse, a trick for bliss. Put back to earth arms and neck, ox and horse. Enjoy the labor that breaks a man for trying, and woman too. This is how eternity works in the blur of days it takes to dig the stones and pull the stumps each rock and root to cenotaph for the hands and hooves that will clear these hills in the industry of will. The years it will take to turn these woods into pasture, and then an orchard will seem so few in retrospect, will seem in fact so lost in a paradise whose name will come to you. I should just mention quickly too here that this orchard was founded by William Darrow back in 1915. Uh, he was a close friend of Senator Aiken and they both collaborated together on wonderful agricultural projects here in southern Vermont. This is one of the few smaller orchards that has survived in the state of Vermont. And just thinking about the clearing of this land, this poem that I just read about that was uh, overwhelming to me. This was all old growth here with huge rocks that horses cleared and men um, who were just amazingly strong and persistent in creating this beautiful orchard. So the second poem is of course about the planting after the land has been cleared. And uh, I should just say also that William Darrow, who was a palmologist, a, palm a poem, and a poem or sound almost exactly the same. A poem is either a pear or an apple. He worked at the University of Connecticut before deciding just to leave that, uh, that um, job. He was a professor there and um, turned to farming solely, which is what he did uh, in 1915. Planting. Saplings lined the hills in rows with raspberries in between. So many, in fact, no other patch equaled Darrow's throughout the state. The soil was rich from sheep and leaves turned to dirt. So the orchard flourished here in a way that William needed to see to believe, then live in its midst, its midst as farmer instead of professor, taking stock, growing as a man like the trees from inside out walking the rows, then stopping to spread his arms and call them limbs for fun, for real, out of love, that which began in the dark of mind and soil, idea and orchard grew as unlike things that rhymed as poems in the trees and poems in his talk. So it took about four or five years at least maybe 10 years for these trees to, uh, these small uh, apple trees to grow into maturity uh, and produce uh, apples. So 
it was probably in the 19, early 1920s that this orchard really started to produce. And when that happened, of course, uh, the workers here had to prune, pruning. Mind the trees in March before the leaves unfurl and blossoms yield to the honey bees and apples start inside the flowers and flutter in the breeze like butterflies in April. Shear the dead and clip the suckers that crowd the limbs. Open the canopies wide enough for birds to fly right through. See how the cuttings beg the question in druid script beneath the trees. Why not eat just roots and berries? To which William's answer echoes still, because we love to grow, plant, and prune. Which isn't, also to, which isn't also to say we don't love roots and berries that grow unchecked like the pines in Garland Pond. Because we're scientists at heart as human beings, we crave the fruit inside the orchard. There are as many pruners as ways to prune, the master said. So they started in and pruned for days until the orchard bled enough and then sealed over and fed its stems with floods of sap as clear as the spring at the bottom of a hill from which they drank by cupping their hands and sucking the water among the trees that called out to them to prune the limbs, thin the apples, and then the land, packing house and pickers to save the orchard from going under by cutting back and back until it yielded just enough in less with blueberries too and retail store, Andrea started to add to the apples with pies, syrup, jellies, and more. Fewer trees, less land, no storage, the right economy for a family farm in a global market that threatens the salt and solvency of local concerns with far too much and smart machines. We taste the difference in the apple's flesh from knowing where and how they grew in a time when the industry has flourished like a weed across the earth. By pruning against the odds, Green Mountain Orchards has survived ironically for more than a hundred years, though none of the pruners are counting. Ripening. From no sign of anything throughout winter, to this bounty of apples, Macowan, Macintosh, Honeycrisp, Honeycrisp, Empire, and Cortland, names that come as naturally as the apples do to the trees and glow as words that conjure a sweetness in our minds at first to such a degree that our ears stick to our tongues and we taste them twice as permitted, yet also see just why of all the fruits they came to symbolize the one that was forbidden, so round, red, and delicious. We either wake to their ripeness or not, and in our waking see beyond ourselves to the miracle of apples repeating themselves, flooding our senses and then our mouths with a crispness that goes all the way down. Harvest. They hang like bubbles for children, like jewels from the chandeliers, like blessings for vagabonds, like rhymes for the poet, like notes for the troubadour, like gold for the grower, like tricks for the snake, like eyes in the air. Color sounds the moment, now, all hands to the trees, like wings they flutter through the leaves twisting each apple from its stem, then laying them down like infant heads in baskets that hang at their sides. No frost, hail, or scab this year to mar the crop. First Vermonters, then Floridians, and now Jamaicans harvest the tree on long two-pointed ladders, proving again what seems impossible at first is possible when a flurry of hands work together to harvest the crop. Goshawk. There is a goshawk, a northern hawk that flies around here and attacks people uh, from above. In fact, attacked me once and I pull a pretty big clump of hair out of my 
head. It's one of the orchard creatures. Goshawk. How many times have I told this story? There I was ambling along in search of dessert inside the orchard when a goshawk dove on me with outstretched talons. There I was all dressed in cotton in the cool of evening, inspecting the trees for infestation when a goshawk harrowed me. There I was pinned to the ground like a reprobate with my liver exposed as a fresh hors d'oeuvre on a dusty plate when a goshawk circled me in figure eights. There I was crawling away behind the trees where the apples hung like brains and nothing I said reminded this bird of who I was. And the final poem, Return, after the harvest and every summer, or actually autumn, after the harvest has been completed, uh, folks gather just over this hill here at a bonfire and uh, where a lot of the prune branches and debris from the year before burned. Return. The harvest is over and the branches bare again. The sun has grown heavy in its path across the sky and falls early now behind the mountain. The air is cool and fresh with the scent of heaven. The sap descends back to earth while the leaves break off their stems and float to the ground. Did they ever exist? The darkness drops again as a sign of the incubus in the void, the freeze. We wait like pilgrims every year, forgetting for now the miracle of apples, dreaming of another harvest that starts as rumor, bumper crop next year, says the almanac, which no one takes that seriously for fear of the opposite happening as the sky's response to mere prediction. The scent of winter signals cold. We smell it now, like the geese and bears and gird our souls by dancing in a circle around the fire that burns the branches that overgrew and lights our faces in evening chill, bearing our voices over the hills and into the blue. I'm Charger Nord, the former poet laureate of Vermont, and it's been a great pleasure reading these poems about this wonderful orchard, Green Mountain Orchards, to you here today on behalf of the Next Stage Quarantine Reading series.